Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the critical but also positive steps that James Rachel articulates in his short piece, The Challenge of Cultural Relativism, has to do with what has come to be called soft universalism. He doesn't use that term here in this essay, but it's often been used to describe the stance that Rachel's, as well as many other people, have taken as a response to this, this problem that cultural relativism seems to pose. And one of the ways to go about presenting a counter challenge, you could say, to cultural relativism, some pushback in a way, is to focus on one of the key premises in the argument, which is that, listen, different cultures, different societies across the world throughout history, they all have different codes of ethics, different codes of morality, different senses and sensibilities of what's right and wrong. And so, because of that, and then all the other things follow. Now, the question is, are the codes that they have really that different from each other? Is there, are there fundamental differences, things that could make them absolutely incommensurable with each other, incomparable? So the question we can frame in this way is, how wide are the differences in the moral codes that the different societies espouse. And Rachel suggests that what we need to do is pay close attention, not just to what it is that people say is right and wrong, but why they think it is right and wrong. What arguments, what explanations do they provide? We need to look at the customs and realize that they are a complex product of both belief systems and value systems. And it could be that the belief systems from one culture to the other are quite different, but the value system might in fact be, if not exactly the same, at least within the same, as we say, ballpark, that is having a similar structure to them. So he says, often what seemed to be a big difference turns out to be no difference at all. He says, consider a culture in which people believe it's wrong to eat cows. This may even be a poor culture in which there's not enough food, but the cows are not to be touched. Such a society would appear to have values very different from our own. Think of how we treat cows. Uh, we actually have more cows than we actually need in our society because we're so hell bent on beef and dairy production. Uh, if it was only, you know, uh, commensurate to our actual needs, we probably would have many fewer of them and we wouldn't be eating them quite as much. So there seems to be a very, very big difference here. Now he says, we have, not yet at, at, we have not yet asked why these people won't eat cows. Why? That's the key term there. Suppose they believe that after death, the souls of humans inhabit the bodies of animals, especially cows. So a cow may be somebody's grandparent. Shall we say that their values differ from ours? No, because, you know, we can say, well, I, if I thought that my grandparent was in this piece of chalk, I wouldn't break this piece of chalk. I would treat it well. Or maybe I'm a terrible grandson and I say, ah, that'll teach you a grandparent, but it would still be some sort of point of comparison. So the beliefs are what make the difference. It's not the values that are fundamentally different. And asking the question why reveals to us what the beliefs are. We agree we shouldn't eat grandma. We disagree about whether the cow could be grandma is how he puts it. 
And then he says, the point is many factors work together to produce the customs are, uh, of a society. Not only are the values, and we could range these in what we call a hierarchy of values, not only are the values important, but also, and he, here he's giving a list, and this isn't necessarily comprehensive, but in this example, it would be religious beliefs, factual beliefs, physical environment. So if we're in different physical environments and we have different beliefs about how the world works and we have different, let's call them either religious or metaphysical beliefs about the nature of reality and the divine and all the other things that go along with it, it's not surprising that then we would have quite different conceptions of what is right and what is wrong. Consider a case from ancient Greece, the Antigone. When we're looking at that play and the character of Antigone, we might view her actions as essentially incomprehensible when she's talking about laws of the divine and why she has to put dirt on her brother. But if we understand that without some sort of burial, the person who she loves, her brother, who has died in combat against his own city, at the hands of his own brother who he killed needs to have that dirt on his body in order for his ghost to rest a religious belief and quite possibly a factual belief about how you know the efficacy of dirt or something like that then we can understand the motivation we can say aha i, I still think that what she's doing perhaps may not be the right thing but i can understand where it's coming from and so he gives another example here that's quite telling. The Inuit, uh, anthropologists studied them and they thought they were you know, quite different from typical Western mores. And one of the issues was infanticide. There was a practice of killing babies, especially girl babies. So it would seem that that you know, shows a radical difference from our own society where babies are generally cherished. Uh, although we do have examples of people abandoning their children or treating their children quite poorly or neglecting them once they actually do have them. Even people who foster children sometimes treat them horribly. Um, but going back to this, if we understand the physical environment, then we can understand why this practice might actually make sense. And he says, well, Let's think about what would happen if the Inuit did not, in fact, engage in any infanticide. He says, the explanation is not that they lacked respect for human life or did not love their children. A family would always protect its babies if conditions permitted, but they lived in an incredibly harsh environment where food was scarce, and so they could not nourish all the babies that they had. One reason was is they would nurse infants long past the stage of being infants into their toddler years, up to four years, sometimes even longer. So this could sustain very few children. The other uh, point in fact that he brings up, the Eskimos or the Inuit were nomadic, unable to farm. They had to keep moving to find food. Infants had to be carried. And because of that, a mother could carry only one baby in her parka as she traveled. So that meant that infanticide would be a way to actually keep at least one child out of the set alive. Why female children? Why eliminate them? Does that show a devaluation of the female in relation to the male? Rachel's points out that actually it showed a equal valuation. It was much more likely that males out there doing the hunting and fishing would die. And so if you maintained a strict equality of proportion between the two genders, then you'd wind up with too many women after a while and not enough men. So when we learn more about the conditions in which a culture is living, sometimes it's clear that we're not talking about radically different values, just very different environments and beliefs. So the Inuit provide a, a great example of that. Rachel's goes on and he says that what this shows us is that we can talk about some values that are shared 
by all cultures. And again, this is what we call um, soft universalism. The idea is that there are universal norms, but we're not saying that they're absolutely exactly the same from culture to culture to culture. There's some adaptability in them, but in general, they're quite similar to each other. And Rachel's only talks about three main functions here of those norms, but he doesn't preclude that there couldn't be many others as well. So let's consider the first one, caring for the young. The uh, Inuit are in fact taking care of the young. In fact, he points out that um, killing babies was not the, the first option typically considered. Adoption was common. Childless couples were happy to take a fertile couple's surplus. And the norm, the value that was in play was protecting and fostering the lives of the young. He also points out another thing. What happens if a society doesn't do this? If a society essentially preys upon its young? Well, after a while, it ceases to be a society because what allows it to continue in time is generations taking care of generations, both uh, for, uh, you know, uh, towards the future and uh, backwards towards the past. The young take care of the old, the old take care of the young. Otherwise, you can't maintain a society or culture. Another example that he gives, truth-telling. It was a great example, he says, Within a society in which there was no value on truth telling, there would be no presumption that anyone was telling the truth because there'd be no, and then there'd be no reason to pay attention to what anyone says. If I want to know what time it was, why would I ask anyone since lying is commonplace? Communication would be difficult, if not impossible, in such a society. What would this lead to? The breakdown of that society. You cannot have a society that has no positive norm of truth-telling. There may be variants about who you can lie to, when it's okay to lie, what it's okay to lie about, but truth-telling itself has to be some sort of value. Likewise, prohibiting murder, which is not necessarily the same as saying that all killing is illicit or wrong, but prohibiting at least some killing. Every society does this. And if it did not do that, you would not have a society because you wouldn't be able to trust anybody not to kill you. He even points out that, let's say we assume we have a society that breaks down like that and that, you know, everyone lives in a you know, mutual distrust and self-sufficiency. Insofar as they gather together at all, they would have to have some prohibition on murder. Not even a family could survive without some sort of sense of let's not kill each other. And we could add other things to this as well. Rachel's doesn't, but you might think about stealing, taking property that is not your own, or sexual morality. There's almost every society on earth, although it may have quite different you know, mores in you know, how people couple with each other, what acts are allowed, has some rules about who can have sex with who and who cannot. And we could go on and on and on and think of other examples. The point here that he wants to make is that there are some moral rules that all societies must embrace. Why? Here's the general principle. Because these rules are necessary for society to exist. The concrete shape of the rule is going to vary from moral code to moral code. He says, in fact, we do find these rules in force across all cultures. They may differ in what they regard as legitimate exceptions to the rules, or they may differ in where the, the, the limits lie or who they're directed at. But this disagreement exists against a broad background of agreement. So he, he concludes, not every rule can vary from society to society. Again, this stance is called soft universalism. And it is a way of undercutting one of the central tenets of cultural relativism, which is that everything is completely different from one moral code to another, from one culture or one society to another. 